Hello, I am Pastor Craig Storley. I am the interim pastor here at Amazing Grace Lutheran Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon. invite you to join with me in a time of centering prayer as we open our hearts and presence to God who is always with us. So I invite you to sit back in your chairs, most importantly to sit in a way that you are comfortable, where you can breathe as wholly and completely as possible, um, despite this time of allergy, despite this time of colds and flu. And so as we quiet our hearts and minds, as we quiet our bodies and our breathing, we become aware of all that is around us, the movement of fans and the various electronic noises, knowing that all is part of God's presence, all is part of God's creation. And we let that be, knowing it is with us. And this day, in remembrance of Jesus' baptism, I invite you to remember God's claim on you in your baptism. And if you weren't baptized, to know God's claim over you still. That God claims you, God calls you God's own, and loves you and will not let go. So I invite you to sit in that claim that God has over you. Hear the words, you are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Breathe that in, breathe it out. Breathe it in, breathe it out. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. This Sunday of the baptism of our Lord. Um, As the lesson or the gospel lesson talks about today, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness in the area wherever the wilderness starts at the River Jordan near Jerusalem. And it says the whole Judean countryside, all the people around and as well as the... um, All of Jerusalem were going out to be baptized by John. Now, John is is there because, as as if you were listening to the gospel, you heard, the one who is coming after me, he says, is greater than I am. And of course, the rumor has to be going around that he is preaching and doing a baptism of forgiveness for people to prepare themselves for the coming Mm. of the Messiah. Okay? Now, when you think of John's baptism, John's baptism is totally different than what we do at the font when we baptize children or adults here. John's baptism was only a ritual cleansing for the forgiveness of sins. Something that the religious people of his day did. Um, They could do in purification baths, but usually was only done on the Day of Atonement, which was once a year, and was always done in the high altar at Temple. So John is shifting some stuff already. He's putting a twist into it. And also, if you think about it, in the context of the day, it's kind of an act of civil disobedience. Now, we don't think of it in those terms, but remember, who is invaded... Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but they are now a governance of Rome. Rome is the political power, and they control everything. They control control King Herod, who who talks of himself as a religious person, but everybody says he's just passing. But Rome is in charge, and Rome keeps Rome's peace with the sword 
and power. So it's very different when we, than when we think about all these people going for this wonderful baptismal event. They're coming in so many ways as to prepare themselves for the Messiah. And maybe, maybe they'll get a glimpse of who that is, although that is not promised at this time, who that is to be. So they're all coming. And think about it. If you can't do anything out in the open, well, what are you doing? Well, we're just going to the, the River Jordan for a religious baptismal immersion, forgivenesses of sins, you know, uh, uh, thing. So they went, yeah, never mind. <laughs> thing. <laughs> And the Romans are going to go, oh, okay, okay, just one of your weird observances. But what are they doing? They're preparing for the Messiah. Now, their understanding of Messiah is very different than our understanding, right? We think of the Messiah as Jesus who dies on the cross, who is resurrected, who saves us from our sins. Now, the people of John the Baptist day and Jesus day are not looking for that kind of Messiah at all. They're looking for the Old Testament Messiah. And the Old Testament Messiah promised is to be a mighty warrior king priest who will bring everyone together and will drive the Romans out of Jerusalem, out of Judea, out of ceremony, out of Samaria, ceremony, <laughs> Um, not with love and kindness, but with the sword and the power of a united Judean army. So they have no sense of what we think of as a Messiah. For them, Messiah is a mighty um, general priest. And that, the one who will come and restore Israel to rebuild the kingdom of Solomon, the kingdom of David, and all the glory that it used to be. So they are not expecting this Jesus character that you and I know who comes in love and grace and brings the mystery of God into it all. So then Jesus shows up at the, at, at the Jordan. And all it says is, and Jesus is baptized by John in the River Jordan. That's the amount of the ceremony. And then as he comes out of the water, then we see that the heavens torn apart. In the Gospel of Mark, that torn apart is literally, if you can think of the most violent word for ripping or tearing or whatever, that's the Greek word for it. The author of Mark wants us to know that it's literally the heavens are ripped apart. I love that saying. You can't tell, can you? <laughs> the heavens are ripped apart. And then it says, He hears a voice coming from the heavens saying, This is my beloved. This is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. That's the word that Jesus hears for sure. It's unclear whether anybody else hears it, but... He hears those words. And that's the beginning of his ministry. Up, and if you read the gospel, this is like the first chapter of the gospel of Mark. There's nothing there until Jesus is baptized, other than a little bit about John the Baptist. And so up until that point, if you saw Jesus on the street, he wasn't with his disciples, he wasn't with anybody else, he's just this man walking along. Or a carpenter, we don't know. So up until this point, he's just Jesus of Nazareth. In his baptism, where God claims him, this is my beloved, with you I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit descends on him, it says, like, physically, like a dove. You know, that something physically, emotionally, spiritually, energetically happened, and, and, and Jesus is changed. And we know that he's changed because he goes from there and goes on a 40-day retreat in the wilderness without food and water. And when he comes back from that retreat, then he is doing his, then he starts his public ministry. Then he starts preaching. Then he brings disciples who he teaches. Then he teaches the people. Then he, 
Then he moves eventually to Jerusalem where he dies on the cross and is resurrected and becomes the Christ. But the heavens torn apart, that when Jesus starts his ministry, it's a reminder to us all that, that, that God is on the loose. God is on the loose in the person of Jesus Christ, and even beyond that, in the spirit that is there. When we are baptized, we too receive the spirit of God, and we too are enabled with God's spirit to go out and share the love of Christ with everyone we meet. And it's not something that's just a nice idea. We are touched by that spirit. It is for us too. The next time you hear the word torn like that is at the end of the Gospel of Mark. And only the Gospel of Mark uses this phrase. Um, and the next time you hear torn, it is when Jesus dies. And the curtain of the temple is ripped apart to remind us all that God is still on the loose. God is not off someplace in some temple someplace, not above the clouds where we cannot see God, but through Jesus and his teaching and his presence with us, we know that God is here. God's spirit is here. Christ is present here. We are now the ones who incarnate who he is, both through our baptisms and how we share that grace with everyone we meet. So think about that this week. The heavens are ripped apart. God is no longer hidden, but God is here. God is here. Amen.